Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. On this channel we oftentimes talk about the rise and fall of various factions. Political factions like the Old Republic, the New Republic, the Galactic Empire, the Federation of No Pants, and the Confederacy of Independent Systems. We've also looked at force organizations like the Sith Order, the Furries, and the Jedi Order. We've talked about all of these organizations' strengths and weaknesses, and covered their struggle for dominance and relevance in the galaxy. These groups are all driven by their desire for control. But the funny thing is these organizations pale in importance and longevity compared to the true constants of this galaxy. I'm talking about organizations that lack both strong ideologies or philosophies, and they don't have loyalty or swear fealty to a group of people or a nation. No, these are entities that sole existence revolves around generating credits. We, of course, are talking about mega conglomerates and groups of corporations who have carved out such a large portion of their market that they've essentially become the industry themselves. These companies are so large that when empires and republics fall, they remain firmly rooted thanks to the sheer importance of the products they sell and also because of the deep roots they've created in their long operating history. Today we're going to be taking a look at a group of monopolies, duopolies, and oligopolies that are the true masters of the Star Wars galaxy. Now, chances are, if you clicked on this video, you're most likely the portion of our audience that really enjoys it when we connect Star Wars lore to real life. The reason why I do this is because I truly think it's beneficial for us to learn as much about our world as possible. The political system, the economic system, how societies are formed. As consumers, as voters, as investors, as Star Wars fans, it is extremely beneficial to develop media literacy, so it's easier to decipher what the hell is going on. But there are some unique challenges in the world of today. Instead of facing massive censorship that's always been the subject of dystopian novels like 1984, we instead are heading towards the reality of Huxley's Brave New World, where we are bombarded with so much information we no longer can tell the difference between the truth and lies. When I don't have time to read every news article out there, I use an aggregator called Ground News. This is one of the only sponsorships I've ever actually reached out to myself. And that's because I believe their website and app can truly benefit all of us. A well-informed public is key to a thriving democracy. I don't really care what your views are as long as you understand those views and came to those views yourself. And when you click on a story in ground news like Google versus US in the biggest antitrust trial in decades, if we scroll down, you can see the bias distribution or which side of the political aisle is covering the story more. You can also click on the ownership tab to see what type of media companies are covering this news. You can compare headlines with convenient tags besides every source to show you who owns it, whether they have a political bent and how reliable they are. I typically have a rotation of left-leaning, center-leaning, and right-leaning news outlets I like to go to, but even then, sometimes I find myself leading too much to one side or another. Ground News actually has a built-in feature called My News Bias. It can show you what your reading habits are like, who your top news sources are, and whether you're getting a diverse perspective of what's going on in the world. It's time for us to all move past the trap that is partisan news. Neither side of the political divide has a monopoly over the truth or all of the solutions. It's always beneficial to see what both sides has to offer before making a choice. You can use Ground News for free, but to get access to all those advanced features, including My News Bias, you need to subscribe. And right now, if you guys click on the link in our description, ground.news slash generation tech, you can get 30% off of their Vantage plan. Thank you for your patience. Now let's talk about some monopolies. Well, actually, speaking of monopolies, did you know in the United States over 90% of our media industry is controlled by just six different companies? That'd be more of an oligopoly than a monopoly, but yeah, kind of sucks. There are many Starfighter manufacturers in the Star Wars galaxy, ranging from massive shipyards like Quad Systems Engineering and Incom Corporation to smaller outfits like Mandel Motors or Theed Palace Space Vessel Engineering Corp. The Starfighter industry has always been an open and free and competitive market, especially during the Old Republic era and not as much during the Empire era where you see a lot of central control over the economy. 
But for most of these starfighters to properly function, you actually need a specific type of repair droid known as an astromech. Usually slotted onto the outside of a starship due to the limited space on board, these astromechs are responsible for not only on-the-fly repairs in the middle of combat, they also are in charge of managing the power systems on board and making them as efficient as possible. And perhaps even more importantly, the astromechs actually replace nav computers you might find on larger vessels. Starfighters are basically too small to have such a complicated machine on board, and so it's the astromechs that actually enable hyperspace calculations. Without hyperspace calculations, you might jump into a star or an asteroid or into a purgle. And this is an immensely taxing set of calculations that very few droids can do, which is probably why astromechs are often very capable. The only issue is in the Star Wars Galaxy, whether it's the R-series droid like R2-D2 or the BB series like BB-8 or the C series like good old Chopper, it's actually all manufactured and designed by the same company. You've probably never even heard of them. They're called Industrial Automation. This company was formed after one of the largest mergers in the droid manufacturing industry occurred in 32 BBY between Industrial Intelligence and Automata Galactica. In 32 BBY, the Republic Senate was characterized as being exceptionally gridlocked and weighed down by bureaucracy. They couldn't even respond to the clearly illegal blockade of Naboo, which is probably why no antitrust lawsuit was ever levied in order to stop this merger. While industrial automation has a relatively clean business record and no major scandals that I know of, their control of the astromech market means that they also have indirect control of which entities can actually field hyperdrive capable snub fighters, which is crucial, especially for smaller defense forces that might use starfighters to patrol large areas of space. Industrial Automaton has a lot of leverage over these planetary defense forces and they could basically get whatever they wanted if regulators aren't watching closely. While industrial automation isn't really known for price gouging, and keeps their astromechs relatively affordable. The lack of competition has allowed for astromech technology to stagnate significantly. If you take a look at the famous R series, many would argue that the newest variant, the R6, remains relatively unchanged from the R2 units as far as function and computing power goes. And the R2 unit seems to have more or less the same functions as the much older C series and the much newer BB series. There's kind of an illusion of choice here, really. You're just looking at three very similar products that share many of the same parts, which were created on a similar assembly line. It's only really the outer shell and maybe the size of these droids that are different. It's kind of like the Corolla Cross, RAV4, and Venza. Come on, Toyota, you gotta get back to your roots. You know, put a pickup bed in one of those things so I can mount my recoilless anti-tank rifle onto it. Anyway, Industrial Automaton doesn't just make Astromechs, they make all sorts of surface droids, which is another problem. It shares this market with competitor Cybot Galactica, which is primarily known for its domination of the protocol droid market. This includes the famous 3PO series. And so if we're talking about service droids, not combat droids, but service droids, these two companies control a huge percentage of the market. If you piss off either one of these companies or, you know, you want something else, you're out of luck. In Star Wars, most companies that sell physical items to consumers still are vertically integrated. That means they design their own products, they manufacture them, and they also sell them. A lot of the biggest consumer product companies here in the United States, from phone companies to automakers, rely on a complicated chain of sub-manufacturers to produce all the various parts needed for the assembly of the end product. This has basically been the trend in global economics for the last few decades, especially amongst publicly traded companies that are very worried about their quarterly reports showing any type of loss in revenue. Last thing they want are short-term focus Wall Street speculators to panic. And so most product companies focus on design and assembly instead of investing money on expensive infrastructure like factories to manufacture parts for their products. They leave that to specialists who are focused specifically on manufacturing and can also scale it. This is what's always made Tesla such an interesting company for me. And no, it's not their products, it's not their cars, it's not the fact that they led the EV revolution, although that is pretty impressive. I actually think you know, as a company, they're too overvalued. What impresses me about Tesla is the fact that it's a fully vertically integrated company. All of the production from software, battery production to powertrain production is controlled and overseen by Tesla. I mean, this is absolutely astonishing given how difficult the car industry is. And it's also really cool that, you know, Tesla is able to do this without any help from traditional 
car manufacturers. If you take a look at Toyota Motor Group, for instance, it relies on a network of 41,427 subcontractors to do everything from manufacturing parts to software development. Because of the sheer scale of the Star Wars galaxy and how large of a market there is, most large companies in Star Wars see it as a good idea to invest in their own manufacturing and virtually integrating all of their supply chain underneath their own control. One of the advantages of vertically integrating your company is that you have more control over the product costs and you also cut out any potential middleman who might be price gouging. You also have a lot more control over your own supply chain, and so it's less vulnerable to competitors, the politics or conflict. But what makes the Star Wars Galaxy so interesting is not only are these large companies vertically integrated, they oftentimes band together into large uh, commerce guilds or unions, and they're able to wield massive amounts of political and economic power. One of these entities was known as the Techno Union. Now, in the old days, commerce guilds were formed to create a certain standard of quality in a profession. For instance, you have a commerce guild for shoemakers, and so they would set standards on what kind of materials you would use for the shoes and what kind of quality you would use for the shoes, maybe how much you pay the people who work in the shops as well. Now, critics of commerce guilds might say that they also monopolized control of certain industries. They were kind of like gatekeepers. Sometimes commerce guilds could control the trade in the town and prevent outsiders who aren't in the guild from selling in that area. In the Star Wars galaxy, these commerce guilds aren't just limited to cities. They're limited to the entire galaxy sometimes. And the main focus in most of these commerce guilds in Star Wars was to lobby the Republic Senate and push for pro-business legislation that would help their members out. This included protecting the free trade zone in the Outer Rim from any attempts by the Senate to levy taxation or create regulations for the area. What's even crazier is just how large the techno union is and how many industries it actually controlled. Now, we talked about Starfighter manufacturing and how it's still relatively a competitive market and industry, but if you take a closer look at the Techno Union, you'll realize that it's a lot less competitive than you'd probably want as a consumer. The Techno Union owned Quat Systems Engineering, who were owners of the largest Starship manufacturing yard in the galaxy, Quat Drive Yards. This was one of the top producers of super class capital ships like the 19 kilometer long executor class Super Star Destroyer. Quant also had different subsidiaries that created niche crafts. They also had Rothana Heavy Engineering, which was designed for stealth products that you know government regulators couldn't see. How do you think the clone army was able to build all those acclimator class assault ships and LAATs and have them ready for the Battle of Geonosis? That was because of Rothana Heavy Engineering, which is hidden out in the outer rim. Then you had Foros Shipyard, which was sold to the Techno Union at a cut rate after the Rusan Reformation. Then there was Carillion Engineering Corporation, who cornered the civilian and commerce market for small and medium-sized freighters. Then you have Senior Republic Systems, which would be nationalized after the Clone Wars and become one of the largest manufacturers of starfighters in galactic history, I would say. Then there was Hardshall Engineering Corporation, who specialized in completely automated platforms with droid brains, but they also produced the C-9979 landing craft and the Sethapede class transport shuttle, which is what Harrison Duel is flying around now. The Techno Union also had under its umbrella Blast Tech, which was the largest blaster manufacturer in the galaxy. They also landed several huge government contracts for providing small arms for the Clone Army and also the Imperial Army. The Techno Union also had a monopoly over the entire combat droid industry and automated weapons uh, manufacturing industry. This included uh, Geonosian Industries, they also controlled Bactoid Industries, which had Bactoid Armor Workshop and Bactoid Combat Automata. Together this conglomerate makes everything from B1 to B2 battle droids to the massive Seppi Super Tank. Then there's Harchal Engineering, as we mentioned before, they also made the Vulture Droid. You also have Colicoid Creation Ness, who are responsible for all sorts of terrifying combat droids, from the Droid Aka to the Droid Tri-Fighter, and of course the massive Scorponek Annihilator Droid. And finally, you have Arachid Industries. They built the feared Viper Probe Droid. The Techno Union was way too powerful for its own good, and they drew the attention of the Sith, who made the Techno Union a centerpiece in their secession plan. And because the Techno Union had so many companies located in the free trade zone in the Outer Rim, they would align themselves with the Separatist Alliance. Although, 
Officially speaking, the Techno Union held a neutral stance during the war and even had representatives in both the Republic Senate and the separatist parliaments. And they were able to play both sides of the conflict against each other and profit greatly because of their massive manufacturing power. You either built ships with the Techno Union or you just didn't build ships. Once on board, the foreman of the Union also had a spot on the High Separatist Council. Talk about, you know, conflict of interest. Little did the Techno Union understand. Palpatine wanted to create a giant military industrial complex following the end of the war, and having a huge percentage of the galaxy's manufacturing already coalesced within the Techno Union made it very easy for him to just basically nationalize the Techno Union. Quat would end up building the Star Destroyers, Blast Tech would arm the Stormtroopers, and Senior Arm would create the TIE Fighter. And thanks to the Techno Union, a lot of these companies are already very well integrated with one another. Prior to the Clone Wars, the Republic didn't actually have a Federal Reserve. This meant that they didn't have the ability to introduce more credits into the system. They couldn't adjust interest rates to fight inflation or maybe encourage more investment. Now, Palpatine was smart enough to understand that only by seizing the banks could he truly begin to have more flexibility when it came to funding his massive projects. At the time, the intergalactic banking clan was technically also a commerce guild, like the Techno Union, except they focused on acquiring assets in the banking sector. The IGBC were the ones who printed the credits, they were the ones who decided what the interest rates were, and they kind of functioned like a cartel, a financial cartel, and they really did uh, manage to steer the economy in a direction that was highly beneficial for them. They weren't politically motivated like some say the Federal Reserve is. Instead, they were just 100% capital focused, which in my opinion is far worse. During the Clone Wars, the IGBC, like the Techno Union, was far too large to be pressurized to just service one side of the war. And so the banking clan maintained good relationships with both governments and funded both militaries. Yeah, I know, it's kind of crazy. IGBC Chairman San Hill, like Watan Bor, sat on the High Separatist Council, and during the war, the IGBC actually started showing favoritism to the Separatists by giving the Republic exorbitantly high interest rates to continue funding the Clone War. But by the end of the war, the IGBC was close to bankruptcy because surprise, when you decide to fund both sides of a conflict, one side eventually is gonna default if they lose. It was just, they didn't, they didn't stress test their bank. I guess they didn't have any regulations, I don't know. Eventually, things caught up with the IGBC, especially after their entire board was killed by a Sith Lord, and their predatory lending practices were revealed to the wider galaxy, and a small military skirmish occurred near their headquarters. It was clear that the IGBC could no longer handle being the uh, major financial power in the galaxy, so Palpatine did him a favor, and he nationalized IGBC, creating his own Federal Reserve. One of the less sexy parts of economics is the logistics and movement of goods. But it is by far one of the most important parts of the economic puzzle, and it's especially important when you're running a galaxy-wide economy. Now, thanks to the Rusan Reformation and the thousand years of peace that followed it, the galaxy was experiencing an unprecedented era of peace. This even extended to some pockets of the Outer Rim. And so as a result, this allowed planets like Mandalore to thrive despite its surface essentially being a wasteland. And this was thanks to cheap and reliable food shipments and other trade products. The galactic supply chain had matured to such an extent that planets like Ryloth were able to sustain much larger and vibrant populations than in earlier periods where most trade happened at the system or sector level. And so a lot of planets are depending on off-world shipments for very basic goods instead of creating some type of food security or other type of resilience on their own planet. And so when the Clone Wars occurred, disaster struck as trade routes began to close down everywhere. And at the heart of this conflict was this free trade zone created by the Republic. The idea was to get rid of all taxation in the Outer Rim and entice large corporations to invest capital in these areas. If they can build factories, that gives people jobs, and they'll probably need security to protect that factory and also build new infrastructure to support all of the shipments on and off world. This was usually a government job, but private entities were more than happy to step in. Now, the Trade Federation had started out as a group of concerned shipping companies who were focused on mediating disputes between different shipping firms. They also made sure larger shipping companies couldn't dominate important trade routes, and this basically really helped a lot of these smaller and medium-sized shipping companies. And so for a while, the Trade Federation was seen as a 
very positive entity. But eventually the Trade Federation evolved into a massive shipping conglomerate on their own and started dominating all those major trade routes in the galaxy they used to protect. Especially the ones that flowed from the core regions to the Outer Rim and vice versa. It was in the Outer Rim where labor costs were low and raw materials were mined and processed, and then manufactured into goods or components that would be assembled in the core. The core was where all the money was, but a lot of the manufacturing in the core was just too expensive and had started dying off. And so most industry in the core was service related. The Trade Federation could easily exert pressure to anywhere in the galaxy simply by changing prices for basic shipments. The Trade Federation controlled almost 100% of all goods entering the Outer Rim territories and they would price gouge the heck out of those shipments, making it incredibly hard for Outer Rim citizens to live a good life. And many of them would actually become indentured servants for the various corporations that operated out there. The Trade Federation eventually grew to such an extent that in the years leading up to the Clone Wars, they could basically do whatever they wanted, not just raise the price for shipping, by literally blockading entire planets until they got what they wanted. The Trade Federation was so powerful in the Outer Rim that it had godlike abilities. It starved entire planets, it destroyed its competitors and smaller companies, but like the IGBC and like the Techno Union, the Trade Federation would eventually be dissolved after the murder of its leader, Vice Roy New Gunray by the Sith. Whatever remained of the company afterwards would be nationalized by the Empire. So there you have it, guys. Those are four examples of how either a single corporation or multiple corporations killed competition in an entire industry. Now, I do have to say there are some positive things than monopolies. Nothing is completely black and white. If run properly, monopolies can keep pricing consistent and reliable for consumers. And through economy of scale, these organizations can also easily make enough money for investment in further technology and innovation. While most monopolies kill competition and hurt the consumer eventually, we do have to look at every situation on a case-by-case -case scenario. Some monopolies are more evil than others. Some monopolies might actually have some benefits to them. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.